Right, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to the plenary session. Um, as you probably guessed, uh, a lot of today is about change, it's about new status and a new era, uh, but it's also about continuity as well. So having duly dispatched in probably record time the first AGM of the Chartered Institute, We've also just dealt with the 31st AGM, by my calculations, of the Institute over its long history. You might have thought it was the 32nd, but uh, I think things slipped right in the very early years of, of the Institute. And that means, of course, that the next AGM will be the Institute's 32nd AGM, and that is the optimum length that we're looking for next time. Uh, so Jan, next, next year, that's your target, 32nd AGM. Um, we're now launching into the plenary session, things that you need to know. Um, your Twitter hashtag is CIFA launch, CIFA spelt like that. Uh, things that I need to know, actually, which I should have checked is, how is the sound? Okay, am I distorting or is that just the content? Okay, <laughs> fine, good. Other things that you may need to know is, Feedback forms, Raksha, do we have feedback forms? We have postcards. Fill in a postcard. Postcards can be in uh, CFA Thank you, Raksha, that's great. And CPD certificates will be available in due course for this afternoon's session, and I'm sure um, the earlier session on, on, on the training toolkit, but I'm sure CPD will also apply to this session if you think this is relevant to your personal development plan, which it is, and all those hidden messages will be subliminally pumped at you over the next hour. Um, so I'm just going to start uh, with thanks, which is an unusual place to start, but I have a lot of thanks to give towards the end of this presentation, so I'd like to thank the people uh, who have organised today, first of all. And already uh, visible and active in the process is Raksha, who has organised this event and has supported the transition from the uh, Institute of Field Archaeologists into the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. And she's also ordered the beer for afterwards. Uh, I have to thank Adam Stanford, who is around somewhere. There he is, the paparazzo, who will be snapping away at us uh, as, as the afternoon progresses. And to Doug Rocks McQueen, who is videoing this um, live streaming, I think, to the website and certainly available from the website later if you want to go through the whole experience again. Um, and also our very generous consultant, uh, Stephen O'Reilly from Loud Marketing, who has helped us with a lot of the messaging and the production of the glorious purple logo that you see before you. And. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Amanda Forster and Kate Geary, uh, my colleagues on IFA, for organising the earlier events this afternoon, and Leanne Burney and Jen Parker Wooding for doing a lot of the running about and making sure that everything happens. Now, into the main part of the event, we have four keynote speakers giving either three or four short keynote addresses. I don't know, you don't know, we will find out. Um, I think we'll take them back to back and then we will have questions and debate. Uh, and after that, I'm going to indulge myself, if that's okay, just by having a few short words with you to um, heartfelt and no doubt inadequate expressions of appreciation to all of those, all of you who have got us from where we started to where we are now. Uh, so into the presentations, we'll save questions to the end. And first off, I'd like to invite Diana Murray, a former chair of the Institute, to talk about not the earliest, but some of the earlier years of the Institute and where she sees it going. Thank you, Diana. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to have been asked to speak. Um, I did have a couple of slides, but my computer spectacularly crashed at the weekend, and so I'm afraid I haven't been able to bring them to embarrass some of my colleagues in their earlier selves. However, you'll just have to imagine what we all looked like in our uh, former days. Um, I'm very conscious that there are many people here who are e would equally be able to do this uh, introduction, if not more um, so than myself. So um, uh, just bear with me. And if my recollections 
don't match yours, then uh, we can have some sort of collective memory perhaps afterwards. Um, as uh, Brian Davison reminded me um, earlier on over lunch, uh, archaeologists don't do history, but we do do material culture. Um, so I thought I would bring an artifact with me which demonstrates why, I think, to me, why we set up the IFA. So this is my artifact. I don't know how many people remember this. I can't wear it because I was at school when I got it. <coughs> um, I think it was given to me by Phil Barker, to be honest. Um, but this is, if you can't see the back, this is I Dig Rescue. And um, it just reminded me as, as a symbol of why there was a need to set up the IFA. Rescue was a campaigning organization set up to protect archaeological sites, raise awareness of them from, discussion, from destruction when there was no opportunity to investigate them. Um, that was the one, one reason why the IFA was needed. The second one was that archaeology had really quite a poor reputation for holding up development, not contributing to economic development of the country. Um, and when it did get a chance to get involved, archaeology was involved, there was an appearance of a kind of hippie culture that didn't deliver anything. Um, the third thing was archaeology was really not seen as a profession. Uh, professionals who were involved were university employees, museum curators, civil servants first and foremost. And in many cases, and there was this argument in the 1970s, um, that uh, what did we need a professional organization for? Because all of these other people had their, all these other professions had their own uh, organizations. So why did we need uh, an archaeological um, profession? And when I was uh, at school and had decided to do archaeology, my history teacher was very concerned and she said, why do you want to study archaeology? There's no future in it. Um, apart from the obvious contradiction in terms, she actually was wrong because archaeology was about to take off. And so in the 1970s, we saw a rapid expansion of archaeologists being employed as archaeologists. Um, and training in universities started to look and recognize the need to train archaeologists to actually do archaeology as opposed to just study uh, archaeological subjects. Um, there was the beginning of the development of the sites and monuments records in local authorities, um, an increase in uh, um, the, the national budget to deal with um, the destruction, uh, the, the, um, the uh, investigation uh, before sites were destroyed. But there was clearly a need to improve the professionalism in archaeology, and a small group decided to do something about it. So from kind of 1973 onwards, um, there was a group that was looking at professionalism in archaeology, and uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, uh, articles about how this all started, so I'm not going to go into that now. But that led to the foundation of the IFA in 1982. The first council, of whom some people are uh, here in the audience, uh, were 16 men and two women. I hope that balance is better today. Um, and really, the first 10 years, from 1983 to 1993, one can define or summarize as definition, discussion, and eventually a director. So in the first 10 years, the IFA was run by the council, uh, later supported by a small executive committee. Uh, and the notable achievements in that period were um, the start of a professional um, magazine, I would call it, rather than a journal, the conference, which I think has always been really important to actually address professional topics, um, a directory of members so that we knew who each other was, uh, and the regional and specialist groups who in the early days were really important in getting the message out to members across the country. There was lots of discussion about definition. What is archaeology? What should the institute do? What should it cover? What was conservation? And so on. And eventually, by the 1990s, when I became uh, chair in the mid-1990s, we had moved into the context of a change in the whole um, development of archaeology. Uh, one of the most significant was the change to development funding for excavation. But we did, 
in, in the 1990s, we had um, uh, got to the stage where we had agreed there was a real need for standards that we could subscribe to, uh, which defined the profession. And uh, Pete was very instrumental in starting uh, that work going. We recognized the need for organizations to sign up to these standards, as well as individuals, and to help and mentor organizations by, peer, by a peer review process to actually generate continuous improvement across the sector. Um, and we recognize the need uh, for a full-time director. So the achievements of the council and all the chairs up to that point culminated in uh, the appointment of a uh, director. And we were incredibly fortunate to have Pete Hinton as the first director, who has continued to build the organization to this day. PP, phenomenal Pete, I would say. I think you've done really well. And what an achievement uh, the IFA has made since, since then and gone on to much greater things. So have we achieved what we set out to do? Have my 30 years worth of subscription been worthwhile? And certainly uh, in the first instance, you know, what did we get out of it? Why did we do it? So there was an element of faith in there. And still today there are people who don't join the IFA. And we need to get them uh, involved, I think, because it's really important that we collectively support uh, our profession. But I would say, yes, we have achieved what we set out to do. We have standards. Archaeology is way, way better than it was in the 1970s. We have clear standards in place derived from continuing practice improvement. We have the code of conduct, which is accepted and adopted throughout, even by those who are not members. And we can now say, and I'm quoting from the CIFA, uh, that we are professionally accredited and staffed in the study and care of the historic environment. Secondly, we have a professional structure, um, a professionalism that is recognized. There are still issues around pay and reward, but again, that is way, way better than it ever was. CPD, training and skills, recognized structures, health and safety, gender equality, now 46%, come on ladies, let's make it 50%. Uh, and, but the 46% is in line with the national average. There are still not as many women as I would like to see in, in the senior uh, end of the profession, but I'm sure that will come uh, as, we, uh, as, as the profession moves forward. And we can now say we are the authoritative and effective voice for archeologists. And I've said, and that again is from quoting from the website. Research and advocacy. How much, we now know much more about the profession generally, who is in it, what they do, the key issues of the day, areas of uh, concern, and a huge improvement in advocacy and influence. We can now say archaeology adds value to industry and society, promoting the value of archaeology to clients and policymakers. So you might ask, what is there left to do? Well, I think that's for the Chartered Institute to take forward, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Um, but to me, we must get more professionals to recognize their institute and to be proud of it and to be members of it. Let's continue to strive for better recognition uh, of archaeologists as skilled professionals with appropriate uh, recognition and reward. And let's continue to support the CIFA in advocacy for the profession, which I can only think will increase in its potential for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. You say nice things, you can come back. That was very good. Um, warmer reception, I was thinking back the last time I stood up at this lectern, which was an earlier life, but um, <laughs> awful flashbacks. Um, Thank, thank you, Diana, for that. Diana has talked about the earlier years of the Institute. We've seen it now through its, its larval form. And uh, we, we come now to recent years and the present. And uh, I'd like to hand over now to our current honorary chair, Jan Wills, who will talk about pretty much anything she likes because she's the honorary chair of the Institute. <laughs> Uh, 
Thanks, Pete. I didn't realise you were going to give me such licence, otherwise I would have written a different talk. However, um, I too have got an artefact, and this is the first issue of The Field Archaeologist, um, which came out in February 1984, edited by David Baker. And some of those who appear in the wonderful photograph inside of the First Council are indeed in the audience, and I'm very pleased to see um, some of the people who had the vision and commitment to set up um, IFA be able to be with us today as we celebrate becoming a chartered institute. So this is available for perusal later, along with the charter, should you wish. Actually, one of the, the founders of the um, Institute of Field Archaeologists, Brian Davison, said to me earlier, um, great prescience, he said when the Institute was being first set up, we thought it would take about 30 years to achieve a charter, and we did it in 32, so, you know, that wasn't bad, really. Okay, well, um, some of the best lines, I think, have already been said. Um, Pete talked about change of continuity. Um, Diana talked about the fact that we need to get more people involved in the Institute, and both of those, or, or those three things, are going to come up in my talk as well. My brief today, um, was given to me was to talk about the transition um, from IFA to the Chartered Institute and what the Chartered Institute means to me. Well, I've got four thoughts to give you on what I think the Chartered Institute means. The first is about change and it's about fundamental change in our Institute. As I, I, I think you will know, um, options for Looking at chartership has been in the IFA strategic plan since the year 2000. There was wide discussion, uh, consultation, dispute and argument. We're a disputatious profession um, about whether we should go forward to a charter application. But I think eventually we agreed and in um, 2013 we submitted our charter petition. The Privy Council that made the Order of Grant and gave us the Charter says some really important things which I think sum up really why um, or sum up what having a Charter really means to me for our Institute. The Privy Council says that new grants of Royal Charters are these days reserved for eminent professional bodies or charities which have a solid record of achievement and are financially sound. In the case of professional bodies, they should represent a field of activity that is unique and not covered by other professional bodies. At least 75% of the corporate members should be qualified to first degree level standard. Finally, in the case of both professional bodies and charities, incorporation by charter should be in the public interest. I think, for me, that's a pretty succinct statement of where we've got to, and I think it's a um, strong endorsement of our achievements over the last 32 years. Having a charter, I think, brings status and recognition, and it should inspire trust and confidence in the work of the members of the Institute. It's a recognition by the state that CFIA is the regulatory body for the profession. It should show to clients, professional bodies, local and national government, that we have a similar standing to, us, to, to other, and in many cases, older professions, surveyors, planners, lawyers, architects, and many more. And it should be the mark of professionalism in archeology. span Research indicates that the general public as well is quite familiar with the idea of a chartered institute. So I think it brings wider recognition um, amongst those not involved in archaeology of the level of professionalism of our members. I looked a, a little at the experiences of other recently chartered institutes, such as um, ecologists and legal practitioners. And most said that they decided to apply for charter for very similar reasons, to raise the profile of their members, to define professionals from those not professionally qualified, 
to protect customers and clients and to promote professional pride and respect. So that's really about change, what I think is a really significant change in our status. But secondly, my second point is I think that actually it's also fundamentally about continuity because chartership, significant milestone though it is, is not an end in itself. It strengthens our position and our ability to achieve our objectives, promoting high professional standards and strong ethics in archaeological practice, maximising the benefits that archaeologists bring to society and bringing recognition and respect to our profession. It is a quote from uh, the strategic plan, but I'm sure you all know that. Many of the long-standing issues and problems within the profession persist. Things haven't magically changed overnight because we have received our charter. The need to develop and raise standards in professional practice, the aspiration to develop and improve career structure and one that is better rewarded, the need to secure funding in changing and often difficult circumstances. And then there are the overarching issues of fundamental importance to the protection of archaeology and the historic environment, such as changes in policy, in legislation and in organisational structures, which sometimes improve, but in many cases threaten to threat, um, promise to or, or raise the possibility of threatening that protection. So it's not a magic transformation, but I think the, the um, new status of the Institute and its members will strengthen our position in tackling all of these issues that confront us. And I would single out particularly, for example, our advocacy role, which Diana touched on. Um, in recent years, IFA has very successfully developed its role in advocacy either acting alone or with other national archaeological bodies, lobbying government and making very, very effective interventions, I think, across all of the UK uh, countries in terms of developing um, policy and influencing legislation and other change. And I think the new status of the Institute, the Chartered Institute, can only give us added weight when talking to government, lobbying ministers, or trying to um, achieve any of our advocacy goals. My third point really is about creating a new vision. It has been a milestone getting to charter for the Institute. Well, over the next year, we'll be um, implementing, consolidating our new governance structure. So in a sense, um, our immediate uh, agenda is one of consolidation. But it must also be one of developing the vision for the Chartered Institute. We must think ahead. How is the Chartered Institute going to develop? What is our next milestone that we're going to be working towards? One major item on the shopping list could be the question of whether we create individually chartered archaeologists. And I'm sure this will be a discussion topic shortly. We need your views on the desirability of this in principle. Were we to decide to go forward, then implementation would, I think, be a medium term objective at best, because it would require both changes to our charter by the Privy Council, and it would also require the development of a membership grade and a method of assessment. Fourthly and lastly, what the Chartered Institute means to me is getting involved in leadership of our profession. Um, Peter Adaman wrote in his chairman's statement in this um, wonderful document, the Institute will of course only be as strong as its members. We need more members. We need to promote the Chartered Institute. We need to persuade the refuseniks to join. We need to persuade all those people who found the form too long or who never got round to it or had something much better to do to come and join the Chartered Institute. Um, we need to particularly gain members in those areas where the Institute is poorly represented. I firmly believe that the Institute is a place where all of 
those involved in archaeology professionally should be able to come together working within the same code of conduct, and the same standards, whether we're working in the public sector, the private commercial sector, um, in the academic world or wherever. The recently chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management reported 25% increase in membership in the three years that followed the acquisition of a charter. So I think we need, and I leave you with this thought, to aim for that or much better for our newly chartered institute. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. As you can see, your Chartered Institute is in very safe hands. Messages there about consolidation, which we know that we need to do, but about vision, leadership, persuasion, Jan's good at that, and looking to the future. And that leads us to our next two speakers, who I believe are going to do a double act between Ben Jervis and uh, Natalie. They're going to tell us what they think. Now, this is quite interesting because we've had a past chair, we've got a current chair. We may have two future chairs here. There is that, that you know, the minor issue of democratic accountability to go through. But I think they've more or less got this stitched out in the sort of Blair Brown kind of way. <laughs> so just whatever you promise now will come back to haunt you. So just be very careful about that. Uh, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing what two representatives of the next generation group think that the Chartered Institute will develop into in, what, I don't know, in years' time. Do come and tell us. Thank you very much. Hello, you're going to get me first. And it's the new generation. We're not, we're not a load of Trekkies or anything <laughs> like that. You know, it's the new generation. Hi. Um, ben and I were asked to come and speak today about the aspirations of the new generation for the future of the profession. So we started by trying to put ourselves into that future and to imagine what it would be like for an archaeologist working in, say, 2050. What, what would their, an average day in their life be like? And what would this mean for the sector and the profession as a whole? So I'm going to start now by taking a few minutes to outline this, this vision for the future that we came up with. And, you know, it is a vision, so it is aspirational and it is somewhat idealised. But this is a future that those currently in the early stages of their career will not only witness, and they will witness, be the ones that witness it, you know, the ones in this room today that are still here in 2050 as professionals. But they will play a key role in helping to shape and influence that future. So following this, this day in the life of our futuristic archaeologist, Ben is then going to take a few minutes to outline how the Chartered Institute can help to make this, this aspiration, this vision, vision for the future a reality. So archaeology 2050, what will it be like? I warn you, I'm going to talk in the first person. So 2050, I spent my morning working on my latest project in which I'm helping a local community to realise their ambitions for the regeneration of their neighbourhood. Here in 2050, public benefit is at the heart of all professional practice and historic environment research, with knowledge, understanding, appreciation and conservation being realised by professionals and wider society collaborating in open, imaginative and innovative ways. This project involves, amongst others, the local authority, architects, engineers, ecologists, youth workers, artists and local community business leaders all working alongside myself and residents to develop a scheme that delivers a better place for them to live and work and a scheme that it's at its very heart embodies the area's industrial heritage which is what gives it its unique sense of place. Here in 2050 heritage professionals are at the heart of multidisciplinary collaborations working with other professionals on an equal footing and with mutual respect. In the afternoon, I attend a meeting about a particularly tricky section of High Speed 9. The current, <laughs> the current proposed route will impact upon several designated cultural and natural heritage assets, and these impacts need to be managed. But the scheme also presents many exciting opportunities for their conservation and enhancement. Here in 2050, society values the historic environment on at least 
equal standing as the natural environment, actively seeking opportunities for its conservation and enhancement. And these are not seen as being in conflict with the agenda for development, regeneration or economic growth. I work in a, a vibrant environmental consultancy within the heritage section of an integrated and multidisciplinary conservation and design team. I have a diverse range of colleagues, both in terms of their background and their career entry route. We particularly pride ourselves on our apprenticeship scheme, which is fully endorsed and supported by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists and many other professional institutes and organisations. Here in 2050, the historic environment sector has a diverse and highly skilled workforce who have arrived in their positions from a variety of career entry routes, both academic and vocational. So I end my day by making a few phone calls to make sure that everything and all the final arrangements are in place for tomorrow, which is our heritage section's CIFA's inspection. In 2050, all practitioners recognise and attach importance to their responsibilities to their profession as a whole. And this is realised through adherence to rigorous professional standards and, and clearly defined professional ethics. So there we have it, our vision for Archaeology 2050, which is where I hand over to Ben. Thank you. So we've painted a view of the future which is built on our own aspirations, which of course may or may not match those with the rest of you in the room. We do, however, believe that chartership will be beneficial in meeting both our aspirations and those of others for the future of the historic environment as a forward-thinking, respected sector whose value to society is widely recognised. However, just as chartership won't automatically bring about improvements in pay and conditions, nor will the granting of charter status in itself bring about such changes. Chartership is certainly a milestone, but it's only one tool in the continuing work of the Institute. Elements of our aspirations relate to the ongoing work of the Institute more generally, but chartership offers a renewed impetus to continue this work with renewed confidence and enthusiasm. The Chartered Institute must facilitate training in standards and ethics and continue to monitor adherence to professional standards, undertaking enforcement action where necessary to ensure that all archaeological work is undertaken to a high professional standard. Indeed, the grant of chartership highlights professionalism within the sector. New standards need to develop and existing ones be continually refreshed to keep pace with exciting innovations in heritage practice. Similarly, chartership should only augment existing efforts to make the Chartered Institute the heart of a network which provides training, mentoring and co career development opportunities, as well as exploring and promoting alternative routes into the profession to ensure that the workforce is diverse in respect to experience, to background and to personality. The Chartered Institute should also be at the forefront of utilising new technologies to achieve the same and reach a wide audience. There are, however, areas where chartership may have a more tangible impact on the work of the Chartered Institute and upon the future of the historic environment profession more generally. As the body representing heritage professionals, the Chartered Institute must continue to collaborate with other sector bodies, such as the Council for British Archaeology, Algeo, FAME, and of course the national governmental bodies, to work towards breaking down barriers to public participation and diversifying the ways in which archaeological knowledge is created in order to maximise the public benefit of our work. The Chartered Institute must also actively pursue the reputational benefits that chartership brings by promoting the concept of a highly skilled heritage professional who is able to work for the benefit of the public to local and national government and, uh, and to other professional institutes through, for example, advocacy, networking events, and the publicising examples of excellence in professional practice. Finally, chartership should be embraced as an opportunity to engage with other professional organisations to demonstrate the value and positive contribution of the historic environment to society as a whole. Chartership, then, is not a new dawn for the profession. It's a natural development in the evolution of the Institute. It offers opportunities to build a stronger, more resilient, diverse, skilled and respected profession 
and I hope that you will all support the Childhood Institute in working towards the realisation of this aim. Thank you. Well, that's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it's all done. It's all sorted. A uh, little bit of work to do, but thank you so much um, for, for that. Um, what do we have? We have recognition, we have diversity, we have continual improvement, collaboration, strong emphasis again on public benefit and engaging with other professions, which cues me up brilliantly for a plug that um, we next gather the herd around the CPD Salt Lick um, between the 15th and 17th of April next year in Cardiff for the annual conference. Uh, the theme of the conference is the future of our profession, or your profession, help me. Well, it's ours anyway. The future of our profession. Um, and uh, in that conference, Jan and I are also organising a session on the future of their professions, where we're getting members of other chartered institutes to come along and tell us about their experience. So hopefully a lot of the things that particularly Ben described, um, we will learn how to do by talking to others who have recently gone through that experience or who are going through that experience now. So let us first of all thank our speakers. So Diana Murray, Jan Wills, Ben Jervis and Natalie Ward. Thank you very much. <laughs>